Part two of our journey across Itosha starts here at Okakweo, at the waterhole where you can watch wildlife 24 hours a day if you so wish. Having said that, calling it a waterhole is a gross injustice. It's more like going to the theatre. The water totally fills the bowl, with a cast of constantly changing animals to keep you interested. In this case, soon after sunrise on our second morning, the waterhole is filled with zebra. They're followed by wildebeest, and soon after that, the kudu put in an appearance. There's something about kudu that I find so appealing. Maybe it's the imperious way this male saunters down to the water. Or maybe it's the friendly faces of the females and their big ears, a bit like my own, that I find so attractive. As the handsome male kudu moves away, another long line of wildebeest and zebra are moving in. So we're also going to take the opportunity to move on and have a look at some of the more local waterholes, starting with one called Hemsbockvlater. This is more a cement trough rather than a waterhole, and in the late dry season, which it is here in September, water levels are so low that the animals get right into the trench to try and reach it. Just sitting and watching them, it's fascinating how unpredictable the zebra can be, particularly the stallions, like these two who superficially seem to get on okay with each other, and then suddenly... About 15 kilometres further on is this rather lovely waterhole called Oliphant's Blood. We found previously that it's a very good place to see black-faced impala. Today was to be no exception, and they're accompanied by a large group of kudu. The large parking area set above the waterhole gives you a really good view of the animals as they arrive. Photographically, this is probably a better location for afternoon filming, especially with the strong contrasting light produced by the calcrete stone. Either way, it provides fantastic opportunities just to watch behaviours. The hearty beasts like to get down on their haunches to drink, whereas the kudu likes to get right in there with it. After about an hour here, we've decided it's time to move on. And whilst everything did look very relaxed, we'd no sooner got onto the main road towards Halali, with two vehicles parked at the side of the road, the driver pointing avidly towards these two young males and we were able to track them for a little while as they made progress, we thought, to the next water hole at a place called Aus. Eventually this young male settled down right opposite the entrance to the waterhole and we thought at first he might cross the road in front of us but by now so many vehicles were stopping to look at him it was clear he was going to sit tight and we decided just to go and watch the kudu instead. As the kudu leave we're going to make our way further on towards Halali but we're going to stop at a place called Kapupu Hedi which isn't so much a waterhole more a viewpoint at this time of year 
showing the vast expanse of the pan itself. While there's no water, there's plenty of grass, and that's what brings the animals here during the dry season. A little further on is Ondongab, and it's very much the same situation here too. No water, but plenty of grass. Next stop on our journey is Homob, which unlike the other two has plenty of animals and plenty of water. Its name in the local language means place without locusts, which is a blessing. At first there was no obvious reason why the animals weren't drinking. Though the elephant may have had something to do with that, there's plenty of space for all if they really wanted to get down there and drink. Eventually the oryx decided they could wait no longer and went in for a drink. But it was only as we were leaving, when we glanced across to the opposite bank, and saw the real reason for everyone's nerves, with this male lion resting under the tree. Even at the height of the dry season, the artesian well here at Rietfontein produces an enormous amount of sweet water which the elephants love. It's also a lot deeper than the surrounding water holes, so they can get right into it for a good bathe. These two, well at least the bull elephant anyway, seem to have other things on their mind just at the moment apart from bathing. But they have come extremely close, so I'm wondering whether they're just curious or whether we're actually in their way and need to think about moving. Well, it seems whatever he was thinking about, the answer was a no. So we're staying put. The water hole at Halali, actually called Moringa, is set some way away from the camp. And to view the elephants and other animals that use it, you sit quite high up on a kopi, which provides an excellent vantage point. Despite the fact we're only a few feet away from this elephant, it's not the slightest bit bothered that we're there. Baby elephants, just like young children, love to play, even with the simplest of things, like a stick. This youngster's fascinated by a piece of bark, though he does get quite irritated with it when he can't quite manipulate it in the way that he wanted.
Apart from elephants and all the usual plains animals, Halali is reputed to be one of the best places in Atosha to see black rhino. We've seen them at night before, but I certainly hadn't expected this one to come walking out of the bush in broad daylight. longer before the distant rumbling of elephants has caught his attention again, but this time it's a large family group. Although the rhino made a strategic withdrawal to the bushes, all this trumpeting is far too off-putting, and it's not long before he decides to leave altogether, perhaps to come back at night time when hopefully it'll be quieter. <laughs> 